Just over six weeks ago, we saw Russian forces withdraw from Kurzon and move back behind a very important strategic position. Hiding behind a river can be a very good place for an army to be. This was taken by almost the entirety of the British press as being a sign that Ukraine was making tremendous advances in this war. I compared it to a tactical retreat, not perhaps the same as the Hindenburg line in 1917, but saying do not underestimate the determination of the Russians here. Well, we now see that in Kherson, Bakhmut and other cities, uh, now they may be held by Ukraine, but they're coming under sustained shelling. Some of it, of course, is aimed at infrastructure, but inevitably there will be a significant number of civilian casualties. And we're now beginning to see Ukrainian civilians leaving Kurzon and other areas. I have a really dark feeling about what Russia intends to do to those Ukrainian cities over the course of this winter. Am I right? Am I wrong? Well, former chief of the general staff, Lord Richard Dannett, joins me from Norfolk to discuss that very issue. Um, Lord Dannett, is this the beginning of the classic Putin tactic of literally shelling towns and cities to the ground? Well, he's been doing that really pretty much since uh, the 24th of February and his initial attack from Belarus to Kyiv failed. Um, he's resorted to the Soviet area tactic of massed artillery strikes uh, to wear down defences and then move forward. But the situation around Kherson is particularly interesting. In your introduction, quite rightly, you said that uh, we all celebrated what was obviously a Ukrainian success in recapturing Kherson. But um, from the Russian point of view, they'd got about 20,000 troops on the west side of the Dnipro River and serious danger of having those encircled um, and uh, mm. frankly, they'd have gone in the bag, they'd have been captured. So they did withdraw and that was pretty sensible to do from their point of view. Now, the situation, as you suggested, is the Russians have dug in First World War style on the east bank of the Zhenipo River, uh, and the Ukrainians control Kherson city. Unfortunately, um, the Russian lines are that close to the city that it's within artillery range. So, well, and we knew it was going to happen. The Russians are shelling Kherson on, on a daily routine basis and making life very difficult uh, in that city. It was, after all, 300,000 in population. Uh, it went down to some 70,000, and now people are leaving, and you can't blame them for leaving. But um, this is not the determinant move of the war. This is a very difficult situation around the southern front, around Kherson. I and mean, if the Ukrainians wanted to, but of course they couldn't, they could mount an assault river crossing across the Dnipro River, 200, 300 metres wide, and, th and that would fail. That is not the right thing to do. What they've got to do at some point in the not-too-distant future is mount a, another counter-offensive elsewhere in the country. Yes, as you say, attacking across a river uh, likely to be a very dangerous, expensive operation. There are, I mean, clearly no prospect, no realistic prospect of peace talks of any kind. Uh, and it's very difficult, I know, to give predictions. But it feels to me, although this whole situation could go on for many years. Well, uh, yes, I mean, I'm just... <laughs> picking up my crystal ball, and I'm not sure whether my crystal ball is any better than your crystal ball, Nigel. But um, I think my take on the situation is that inevitably it's winter. Uh, the war of movement has literally gone into the deep freeze. Yes, we're seeing uh, shelling of the civilian population in Kherson. We're seeing a very determined Russian attack by drone on Ukrainian power infrastructure. And that'll be a failed attempt to try and undermine the Ukrainian population's will to continue. It won't work. We've got two Ukrainian people living with us, and they're quite clear, in touch with their father in, um, in Ukraine. The, the morale of the Ukrainian people remains very high. So what we're going to see at some point in the late winter, early spring, the Russians having mobilized a lot of additional troops, poorly trained, terribly equipped, um, clothing terrible. They will try and mount another offensive. I'm happy to say at this stage, I'm almost certain on the evidence presented, it will fail. Now, that is the moment that the Ukrainians, with the benefit of Western arms, ammunition, the training we've been giving them, 
have been 10,000 Ukrainians being trained in this country uh, to be combat infantrymen with the capability that they've built up. When the Russian offensive in a few weeks, months to come fails, as I'm sure it will, that's the moment for the Ukrainians to mount a really vigorous counteroffensive in the same way that they did around Kharkiv in September and really push the Russians back. And you know, if they are able to strike decisive blows, I think the morale of the Russian army, their conscripts, their recently mobilized people, is so brittle that they may well collapse. And this is the moment for the battlefield to change, the dynamics of the campaign to change. And that's the moment, not now, that's the moment that negotiations could start. Because remember, President Zelensky has said he wants the whole of Ukraine back in Ukrainian hands. So he's not going to negotiate anything less than that. Putin, on the other hand, has got to get something out of this. So at this precise moment, mm. their negotiating positions are impossible. What's got to change is the battlefield. And I think the Ukrainians over time, in the next few months, could well change the battlefield. That'll change the dynamics of the whole war. Lord Danner, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts, your views on this situation. Thank you. Whatever happens, there will be a lot more loss of life.